Welcome to the Osimo Early Bird Podcast. It's your old pal Emac coming to you with one Adam Ship My Money Sharer on our actual scheduled day of Thursday. We are, of course, recording this on Wednesday night, but then Adam's hitting the road and he's off uh, to the, to the uh, not really the Midwest. What do we call Tennessee? It's not the South. It's the South. Is Tennessee me... considered the South? I think so, yeah. All right. Is Virginia I think it, I think... considered the, the South? I think any state Andrew Jackson's from is considered the South. Okay. All right. There you go. Kate, Kate, just that. Boom. There you are. I did not know. Old Hickory. I did not realize he was from uh, Tennessee. I've been to Tennessee a few times. I will yeah. say Nashville, a far cry from Bristol, Tennessee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bristol, Tennessee is what you would have thought Tennessee was like probably 50 years ago. And probably was like 50 years ago across the state. Nashville, a little more prosperous, uh, a fun place to go. So uh, you're going to have some fun there. It's actually the Rock and Roll Half Marathon this weekend in Nashville. I know that because I did it on my 45th birthday a couple years ago. You will be there for a different reason, though, Adam. Tell our loyal listeners what you're doing this weekend. Yeah, just going to hang out for the NFL draft. Uh, a couple of friends got the okay from their wives to go. So going down there with them and just going to hang out. That's a good time. I'm 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 actually jealous. I've always I've always been fascinated by the draft and I loved in the it was like the early 90s when they really started televising it on Sundays, uh making it a whole spectacle and then of course now it's like round 1 is Thursday, round what is it? 2 and 3 is Friday and then up through what round 5 or whatever is Saturday and then there's someone's it's just like it's never ending now, but it's interesting. It's a good time. I used to wake up um cuz it was always on my birthday, April 30th. So I would wake up and we lived in uh in, on the West Coast in the state of Washington, so I'd get up at 4:30 in the morning. They would show it on ESPN. There were no highlights back then. This was like ESPN it was, was barely like legitimately barely a channel at this point. This would have been like I don't know, 82 maybe, 83, something like that. So I'd get up and watch and they would literally take the full 30 or 45 minutes it was longer than it is way longer than it is now uh, of clock time so i would get up at like 4 30 when it would start and i would get to see like seven teams pick and then i'd have to go to school and then i'd never know what happened because we'd have to wait until the paper came out the next day because there was no espn.com to go look at yeah that that sounds miserable <laughs> it was not a good time it was not a good time. That's why we played our fantasy sports, Stratomatic, the sports with dice, because we didn't have video games so, or computer simulations. It was tough times, Adam. Tough. Shit, we actually had to go out and play by ourselves. And if you didn't have enough of your buddies, you had ghost runners. I'm assuming you played a lot of ball. You had ghost runners, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. <laughs> In this small town we were at, there was, was not really enough of us to, you know, you, hopefully you'd get six guys together and then you play these modified rules of wh- how hard you could hit it or if you hit it. It too too far in the air it was an out not a home run and stuff like that because otherwise you were just chasing the damn ball forever yeah. but anyway let's talk about chasing the ball let's talk about dfs here we go raining myself back in we have a split slate but it's all over the place there is a 12 35 game with zach grinke going against jameson tyon and there's a 220 game with ross stripling theoretically going against john lester We'll have some projections for that. They'll hit that on the uh, early um, DFS um, early strategy show, but we're not going to cover that now. There's also a 640 game. Uh, Cincinnati is one of the teams that is doing the any game on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday before the end of May will be a 6 o'clock hour start time. So that's going to be Atlanta and Cincinnati. But we will go game by game here for you on the five-game main slate there is uh let's see is nhl starting let me see i know nba is uh, a light one on thursday there's just one game it is the denver san antonio game this is game six so potentially that uh, could be a series ender and then nhl i think they are starting off uh, a couple of series so let's look at that we do have columbus at boston game one of that series and dallas at st louis game one of that series which of course we will have projections for as well and you will have a show with one jay Carey breaking that down uh, we're one of the last stalwarts there doing nhl contest or content adam and i've loved it uh, this, thus far in the playoffs i'm up uh, 550 dollars in nhl it's pretty cool. 
And I'm, right. I'm only playing about 50 bucks a night. It's awesome. Yeah, no, that, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll take it. Now, what are we going to take here with our uh, our baseball? Well, we've got we've got a one youngster on the mound, but we'll uh, we'll go back here. Let me get to the, the schedule here. I don't know why, but today I'm going by the uh, ESPN schedule. So let's start off here with none other than Miami and Philadelphia. We have Caleb Smith going against Aaron Nola. A couple of the key guys are dinged up there for Philadelphia. Still a tough matchup and a ballpark downgrade for Caleb Smith, but he does have some strikeout upside. Aaron Nola, on the other hand, gets a phenomenal matchup going against the Miami Marlins. Yes, they are not in Marlins Park. However, Aaron Nola, talent-wise, is in the argument for top three of our 10 pitchers tonight. Uh, not to spoil the complete lead, but we do have uh, Trevor Bauer and Garrett Cole. I don't know where to put uh, Nola uh, and uh, Tanaka in there. I don't know if, if you group those guys together or if you'd uh, you'd break them out into into top three and, and one one guy kind of by himself there. But we'll find out soon enough, Adam. So take her away here. Let's start off with Nola going against the Miami Marlins. Yeah, I mean, I think he's the number one pitcher. When you look at price and you look at matchup, you have a Miami team that has a lot of bad hitters. You know, you have some strikeouts in the lineup. And despite a slow start to the year, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with Nola. I think that he's still perfectly fine. And so, you know, in a really good spot at an affordable price tag. Nola's, I think, the number one pitcher, not in terms of talent, but just in terms of, you know, matchup and price on the slate uh, going against Miami. And then on the other side, Caleb Smith actually is my favorite mid-range pitcher uh just you know philadelphia is a team that i don't love taking pitchers against but the lineup is a little bit watered down without gene segura without kingery and smith just has really really good stuff it's a park downgrade in terms of power which means that the right-handed power bats in the philadelphia lineup um are certainly good one-offs against smith but it is a park that plays up strikeout numbers as well and smith certainly has the stuff to strike guys out that is kind of like horrid timing that uh, that both of their middle infielders went down. I mean, they they got uh, Segura there from the Mariners, uh, and then Kingery's he's been one of their guys. But I kind of I, I'm nope. I felt bad for a minute, but not really because they still have Harper, Hoskins, Franco, Real Muto, McCutcheon, Cesar. What do you know about uh, Quinn here, Roman Quinn? Doesn't... He's not very good at hitting. He's really fast. Ah, okay, there we go. I knew he had to have something uh, that would keep him in the lineup because he's been there, been in there quite a bit uh, over the last uh, stretch here. So yeah, Her- Herrera's also hurt, so that's why. Ah, thank you, Odubel. There we are. I knew it seemed a little thin because I saw that Franco had moved up out of the eight hole and was uh, was headed up the, uh, the lineup order. So uh, anyway, looking uh, at that one, I think that is a potential. I like your one-offs there. Uh, as you mentioned, maybe maybe get a duo in there and hope to get some synergy, but not the easiest matchup there against once one Caleb Smith, who does have a 27% strikeout rate over his last 350 right-handers faced and a 26% strikeout rate against his last 145 lefties faced. On the other side here, Nola, um, Adam, is not his... His strikeout number slightly declining over what they had been. This is stretching back all the way to 2017. So against 800 lefties, he has a 25% strikeout rate, and then which is still good and and you know better than most against righties. It's 28 uh, over his last 830. He had been closer into the 2930 range uh, it, when we were looking at 2017, and then 2017 and 2018, but started to trend down there a little bit uh, as he had some some moments where he was dinged up. Talk to me about him. I don't see anybody in the Marlins lineup worth panicking over. Like literally anybody. You said to talk about Nola. Yeah, yeah. He's he's just the top guy. I think there's uh, nobody that you're concerned about in the Miami lineup. I mean, Granderson and Walker and Anderson are all okay. Prado doesn't strike out, but um, Nola's price tag is really appealing against this Miami team that just isn't very good. I'm not concerned about. And he, I'm not concerned about his struggles early on in the season. I don't think there's actually anything wrong with him. And I'm going to just keep running him out there. Their projected lineup has five right-handers that have a less than 126 Woba against fellow righties. That is, that's hard to do. 
that's like me and you being in there, Adam, in the lineup. We would, yeah. we we would potentially. Well, you would compare potentially with Isaac Galloway or <laughs> Miguel Rojas uh, from from the from the batter's box. Not on the field though. We're I, not on the field. All right, let's move on to the next one here. This is that's that game's feeling like mostly uh, pitching. Our next one we get a little a little bit more interesting here. You have, from the hitting standpoint, that is, you have Jordan Zimmerman, you have Rick Porcello. You've got a couple of, uh, at this point in their careers, inning-eating stalwart right-handers that have been around pretty much forever. They uh, generally don't get their ass kicked on the regular, but they will give up the crooked numbers if things aren't going their way. Generally, they don't shut teams down. This is in, 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 a little bit intriguing. I know you... You usually have decent takes on Zimmerman. He's going against Boston, but Boston, the I mean, the, the whispers are turning into low rumbles at this point, Adam. They may just shake things up this year. They've been doing so poorly, but every time I look at that lineup, I say there's no way they can. But I don't know what's going on there in Beantown. Talk to me here about Zimmerman, and then let's focus on Porcello from the pitching angle first, and then we'll talk favorite hitters. Yeah, I really don't have any interest in the pitchers here. Uh, Jordan, I, I'm not taking Jordan Zimmerman against the Red Sox. That's just a disaster waiting to happen, especially because Zimmerman's not really, really cheap or anything. And then Rick Porcello just sucks. Uh, you know, at best, he's an average pitcher. The Tigers obviously aren't a very good offense, but you actually have some high upside SP2s on this slate that I would rather roster than Porcello. Um, like between the two pitchers in this game, I would lean toward Porcello just because you have, you know, obviously a lot worse hitters in the Tigers lineup, but, you know, not a big swing and miss guy. Ground ball numbers haven't been as good. Uh, gives up some power, and there is power in the Tigers lineup, you know, at least like one through four with Ken Delario through Goodrum. So uh, not really interested in the pitching here. All right. We have uh, the Boston Red Sox carrying a 5.6 implied run total against Zimmerman, and that is with uh, uh, their projected 7, 8, 9 of Bradley, Lynn, and Sandy Leone. Wow. Um, so top top four, top five, top six. How uh, If you're building your ideal Red Sox stack of our projected lineup of Ben Tendy, Betts, Moreland, J.D. Martinez, Xander Bogarts, and Rafael Devers, which uh, which ones do you want to which one do you want to lop off of that? Um, I would take anyone in the top seven. I would throw Jackie Bradley in there at thirty one hundred dollars. I think that he's actually a really good play here against Zimmerman. Um, so just mix mix uh, mixing and matching. You know this entire team, I think, is is good. You know, obviously the optimal stack is is Ben and Tendi through Bogarts, but you know you can certainly get creative and get Devers in there and get Bradley in there. If you were looking to do that, getting creative, would you would you be uh, somewhat comfortable if it went Moreland skip two and then got to Devers and Bradley for that savings? Because we're going to be talking about Bauer and Cole here, and we while we have our dream uh, scenario for the Boston Red Sox anchoring our offense, that probably is not going to be the case. Are you okay gapping two guys in your stack? I it doesn't it's not ideal, but it doesn't bother me. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm playing 150 lineups. I'm going to have some like that. Um, if I were like hand building a lineup, I wouldn't love skipping JD Martinez and, and Xander Bogarts. I would probably leave Ben Intendi off the top because you get higher upside from Martinez or from Bogarts at the shortstop position. But you know, again, like I, I don't set any kind of rules or. Yeah, no, I was I, uh, sorry to be more clear. I was just looking at the DK pricing and trying to figure out if we were going to go for our cheapest three man of here. It, it's nice to get Bradley and Devers next to each other at that 31 and 3,800 respectively. And then Moreland's the next guy who's under 4,500. He's at 42. So I was just wondering if, if yeah. missing two guys was, especially the four or five hitter, would, would be a problem. I mean, baseball, it's funny that way. Uh, as long as your guys are on base when when your guys are hitting, it's not that big of a deal. It just won't happen quite as much depending on the sequence of outs. So, uh, on the other side here, going against uh, Porcello, you mentioned uh, the top four guys here. Uh, any particular call out, pitch type, anything like that that you want to point out that uh, stands out for any one of them, uh, profile wise? Castellanos is the one. Just he's just far and away the best hitter on this team, and Porcello isn't really intimidating against either side of the plate. He doesn't miss bats and you have, you know, a 310 foot wall uh, or a wall 310 feet away from home plate in left field for these right-handed hitters. So uh, Castellanos would be the guy that I like the most here. All right, let's get to our next one. This is going to be kind of fun. You have Trevor Bauer 
who uh, is is the one of the more studious pitchers in uh, trying to figure things out. He's embracing the new uh, strategies, technologies, uh, etc. And he's not a fan of anybody from Houston. Uh, we had him calling out uh, the whole Houston staff last year for a significantly increased spin rate on a lot of their pitches, and he said they were using resin or something else uh, to that effect to increase that. So he did it himself for an inning and said, look, you can do it and not get caught, but just look how much my spin rate increased. Doesn't it seem comparable to what these guys have done year over year? So he's active on Twitter. He particularly doesn't like Garrett Cole. Uh, He's really no fan of of Verlander either. But uh, looking at this one feels kind of exciting. These guys aren't going to be able to throw at each other, although they could, Adam. That would be definite ejections, but (laughs) conceivably they could. Uh, But what do you think here if you have to pick between one of them? You've got Bauer, a little bit cheaper at 9,800 going against Houston. you got Garrett Cole, had a rough outing here and there, but he's going against uh, the Cleveland Cleveland lineup that is – getting a little more healthy. They got Hip- Kipnis back. They've got Lindor back. So uh, they're they're getting a little better. Still not as good as they were last year. Uh, still missing uh, four of their main uh, stalwart hitters, but uh, at least better than they were at the beginning of the season. If you had to pick one, which way would you go? Trevor Bauer, because he's a better pitcher and he's less expensive. The matchup against Houston is obviously tougher than Cole's matchup against Cleveland. But, I mean, Bauer to me is just like the best pitcher. And... I can get him at less than, you know, a little bit less than $10,000. So that's pretty appealing. You know, he's had a couple of tough matchups from a strikeout standpoint already this year. He's coming off his most recent start. He had a 15% swinging strike percentage against an Atlanta team that's tough to get swings and misses against. His first start of the season, he had a 15.7% swinging strike percentage against a Minnesota team that we know is very difficult to get swinging strikes against. He struck out 43.5% of the hitters in that Atlanta game. He struck out 39.1% in the Minnesota game. He is just absolutely phenomenal as a pitcher and not not even to bring the narrative in. Like the narrative doesn't matter, but it also doesn't hurt that uh, there is history. You know, you mentioned the history between him and this team, him and Garrett Cole, too. You know, even prior to uh, Bauer calling out the pitchers on the Astros, they were teammates at UCLA and they absolutely hate each other. Oh, I did not remember that, but I do remember you bringing that up last year. Good call out. Because wasn't one of them, one got mad that the other was considered the number one guy? when they I, were- I don't remember what the the backstory was, but they definitely don't like each other. All right. There's got to be a girl involved, too, right. because that's <laughs> that's how it works in sports. They're just, a, um, I, I, from what I remember reading, part of it's just that they're two entirely different people. Like, Bauer's just a nerd and kind of a asshole, um, and Cole's just like, the exact opposite as far as not being a nerd, I guess. And they just kind of clash personality wise. All right. This is, this is from the, uh, this is an article from MLB.com. It was from May 24th of last year when they, these two guys faced each other. Uh, it says it's no secret that Indian starter Trevor Bauer and Astro starter Garrett Cole did not get along during their days as prolific call a prolific collegiate pitching duo for the UCLA Bruins. Much has been made over the years of that history, but Bauer took a step forward trying to move on prior to Thursday's game. After a lengthy conversation with MLB.com as well as The Athletic, Bauer praised Cole for the season he had put together for the Astros and said he was looking forward to locking horns with the the right-hander in Sunday's finale. Um, let's see the way Bauer tells the story is Cole was one in a long line of people who doubted he could succeed in baseball, but he doesn't want to waste the mental energy holding a grudge bullshit. (laughs) (laughs) We had a rocky relationship in college because he told me I had no future in baseball and insulted my work ethic when I was a freshman. We did not, I did not take kindly to that. So we have had, uh, we, we had some feelings over our issues. There you go. There was still going to be a girl. They just they didn't get to that part. I'll have to go look at TMZ to find out that particular information. But in any event, back back to our hitters here. Come on, it's Thursday, guys. You got five games. Let's have a little fun, or this is going to be a 12-minute podcast. But uh, Cole and Bauer um, kind of singing their praises, yes. If you were to end up with any hitters at all, which we will if we're playing you know, more than 20 lineups, any of the guys that, that you feel somewhat okay with. Um, I had the famous words, I think it was Saturday when I said, yeah, I don't see the need to take any Rangers against Garrett Cole. There's, there's no way they're all going to get to him. 
And they did. So there you go. Congratulations. And I even called out Max Stassi, uh, his teammate, and said, yeah, ha ha, he only has two hits on the season. Got his first home run of the year. So I'm not saying anything bad about these guys. But would you like to say something good about any of them? No, not particularly. Um, you know, if you wanted to go to cheaper guys on Cleveland, you have a $3,500 kitness. Lindor is, you know, a good player for 4500 Jose Ramirez at 4200 But no, there's nothing to talk about hitter-wise here. All right, we got two more games to go here. Uh, it's kind of a choppy late slate. I'm guessing that we'll probably take the 8 and the 9 o'clock games together and somehow decide the 10 o'clock game is too far apart, and that will become your uh, solo late night uh, single game contest. But let's look at the, the second to last game. You have the New York Yankees out there in Los Angeles continuing. Uh, actually, I think they're wrapping up their series there against the Angels. You have Masahiro Tanaka and Trevor Cahill going against each other. A uh, tough matchup, or tough to trust Cahill, I should say. Gary Sanchez was back on uh, Wednesday. We'll have to see if he's going to be in the lineup uh, back-to-back here, but that helps out uh, the Yankees tremendously. They're still missing you know, four All-Stars on the dis- or the injured list, but uh, Cahill could be in line for a, a potential uh, SP2 from a strikeout upside perspective. And then Masahiro Tanaka, yeah, the the Angels are a little bit better when they can go against righties, but there are no great shakes against Tanaka. The only people that really really put any uh, concern into it are Bohr, just because he has power and he has the platoon advantage, and then Mike Trout because, well, he's Mike Trout. Starting with the pitchers here, Adam, what is your initial take since they make up 20% of our player pool? Yeah, I mean, Cahill is okay. It's still a watered-down Yankees lineup, but I would put him behind Caleb Smith. I would, depending on who's pitching for Texas, um, possibly put him behind Taylor Hearn as well. So, you know, at best, just a secondary option for me. And kind of feel the same way about Tanaka because while I think he's a really good pitcher, you uh, you don't have a lot of strikeouts in the, the Angels lineup. You know, even Domingo Armand uh, the other night, who I think is better than Tanaka, you know, or has better strikeout stuff than Tanaka, uh, even he only managed to rack up four or five strikeouts against this team. It's not that it's a dangerous lineup. They just put the ball in play. And when you do have Aaron Nola at a similar price point going against Miami, um, and you do have you know Trevor Bauer for only a little bit more, even though he has a tough matchup, he is just the better pitcher. It's tough for me to really prioritize Tanaka either. All right. So so here's – this is just going off uh... – so not all these guys will be in the lineup because this is the projected one that went against uh, against Sabathia. But against righties, you've got uh, Trout is the only one that has above, and so this is excluding um, Bohr, but he's the only one that has above a 200 isolated power. So he's, he's amazing. He strikes out 18%. Well, that 18% is one of the highest strikeout rates amongst some of their guys. Andrelton Simmons, 8.4. Albert Pujols, 11.8. Jonathan Lucroy, an even dozen. Uh, Kevin Smith, 11-4. Tommy LaStella, uh, who should be in the lineup, 11. That's incredibly low, Adam. That I mean, the worst is Cole Calhoun and, and Brian Goodwin. And even those guys aren't horrible because they put the ball in play a lot too. Right, exactly. It's, it's just not a, an appealing strikeout matchup. All right, well... Double plays, sadly, we don't get double bonus points for those. Uh, looking to any of the Yankees here, uh, maybe maybe a Luke Voigt, Gleber Torres. A lot, of, a lot of righties, not a lot of lefty power with those guys on the DL. Yeah, I think Brett Gardner is probably the most interesting one for me because uh, Trevor Cahill is not good at holding runners, never really has oh. been. I think you could see Gardner if he gets on the – and Cahill will walk guys, and we know Gardner um, is someone that – can be patient. Yeah, he can get on base uh, without you know getting for a bunch of power. So I do like Gardner. All right, final game of the night. We do not have an official pitcher. Uh, Major League Baseball, uh, the pitching page has Adrian Sampson. If it is Adrian Sampson, load up on all the Mariners. That's uh, the best analysis we can give you there. It could, however, be the debut of Taylor Hearn. Adam and I were talking a little bit uh, about him uh, in the pre-show here. Adam, and the one thing that popped out dramatically is, one, he's a lefty, and two, he's kind of young, and three, he has a wicked strikeout percentage thus far in the minors. Now, he has uh, spent, let's see, in 2005, he had uh, 12 total appearances, mostly uh, one start. Oops, I'm sorry, I read that backwards. Uh, uh, pardon? What? 
2015. Yep, 15. Thank you, thank you. So 15, he had 11 starts, 12 appearances. Uh, they were in uh, rookie ball and then uh, uh, end of the season, A ball. Uh, in 16, he uh, again went to rookie and then he he hung around in the Sally League there. Uh, in A ball, made uh, 16 more starts. Then he moved up the next year um, to uh, advanced A, but was still in, in some some uh, uh, rookie balls and then rookie ball. And then last year he was double A. So let's start looking at with those double A numbers, Adam. He made 24 starts, uh, a nice a nice continuation of uh, his strikeouts. He had 140 strikeouts uh, across his 120, uh, let's call it 130 innings. So that's good to see. And then in uh, this year he has uh, made four starts. He has 20 strikeouts across 20 innings. These are some solid numbers. That was coming out of the PCL Pacific Coast League, which is generally a hitter's league. So uh, good to see there. What do you want to do with him? Because your pricing may vary. I'm going to go call up uh, Yahoo here and see what he's at there. But he's not cheap on DK. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really scary matchup against you know some good right-handed power hitters from Seattle. But the price tag being where it is, you know, you and I talked about it a bit before the show, it makes him appealing in tournaments because he has a steamer projection of eight and a half strikeouts per nine innings, which isn't bad. His walks can be an issue. It's not like this is a safe play by any stretch. But, you know, I don't think Caleb Smith is a safe play at 7,300. I don't think Rick Porcello is safe at 7,800. I don't think Trevor Cahill is safe at 7,500. We need the roster somebody. So... I would imagine that with right now Seattle having a 4.8 implied run total and this guy being um, a, a pitcher making his major league debut, having thrown only 20 innings above double A in his career, he probably doesn't pick up ownership. And there is at least uh, some upside with him. You know, it, la- uh, last season at double A and then so far this season at triple A, he had struck out better than a, a, hit, a right-handed hitter per nine innings. So it's not like he's just, you know, piling up strikeouts against lefties and struggling with righties. Uh, he he is a fly ball pitcher, but this is a park that uh, mitigates that issue a bit. So, you know, again, it's, it's not safe, but I think that there is some upside here and it probably comes at low ownership for a five game slate. All right. He is not in the Yahoo player pool. He is not in the FanDuel player pool. I'm looking to see if he is over here and fantasy draft. Do they have their pricing up? They do. Let's uncheck the probable pitchers let's look him up he is of four- course he is because he's on he's in the track <laughs> <laughs> big brother little brother here can you guess his price 14 <laughs> four yes adam oh, good. it's like you have a crystal ball there you are kreskin <laughs> himself but there we go so if he's in this is this is going to be very intriguing because the question becomes are people going to pull the trigger at that price point and i hope not as many would as you know if he was that their traditional 56 5800 price tag on dk as uh you know one of the rookies or somebody that 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 could get a call up i like that there's more of a floor there uh the mariners are not the easiest against lefties they have some some outstanding guys there with hanniger although they're they're kind of price probably it looks like to face Samson, at least on DK, because Hanniger's 56, Domingo Santana, 49, Edwin Encarnacion, 45, Dan Vogelbach, 51. I'm guessing he wouldn't be 51 in a lefty-lefty matchup. Uh, and then Jay Bruce at 4,900. So uh, the righties I mentioned are all fine, and you can throw in Tim Beckham as well. Uh, against Hearn if you're looking for a little bit of leverage here on our short slate uh, since it is a rookie potentially making his very first start ever and uh, we know that outcomes vary wildly when that happens. Um, talk to me a little bit about Marco Gonzalez here. He's someone that I like a lot because you know I'm a Mariners fan. Lafie likes him. I think Lafie is a little bit higher than I am for his strikeout um and I, I'm using the word upside. I think potential is the better word. I think Loffy would even agree that it's probably capped out at about one per inning. But it's it, he does have some moments, Adam, where it looks like he could get up to that kind of level regularly, which would be really, really good uh, for for a number three starter, particularly a lefty of his skill set and nominal at this point uh, salary hit for the Mariners. But uh, what do you think about Gonzalez going against? No, never an easy Texas lineup. 
I think he's he's fine. It feels a bit safer than some of the than all of those like mid seven K guys, K Hill, Hearn, and uh Smith. But and Texas does have strikeouts. So, you know, that should help Gonzalez. He's just not a guy that, that gets a lot of swings and misses, doesn't usually get a lot of strikeouts, but Texas should help him out in that regard. So, you know, if if you have the money to get from, you know, a Caleb Smith or something up to Gonzalez, then uh I don't, I don't hate that idea, but I will probably take the savings and just take on some risk at SP2. Uh, I also think Joey Gallo is a really good – did Joey Gallo get hurt? Why is he not in the projected lineup? Hmm, that's a good question. Let's look and see, Joey Gallo. According to – let's see. Our friends at – it's, I'm talking slowly because my internet's not responding, Adam. My internet's hurt just looking up Joey Gallo. Yeah. Seriously. I, it's I, not mean, I, get, I, I, Google, I don't see anything. But I don't know why he wouldn't be in the projected lineup that I'm looking at. All right, here we go. Uh, nothing there. Let's do a quick name. Did you search Twitter for his name? No. I mean, because it's not like they're going to keep him out of a lefty-lefty matchup against he's, Marco. He's probably the best hitter on their team against lefty pitching. Right, and Marco does give up home runs to lefties, as we have seen. Uh, no, I'm not seeing anything. So okay. uh, whoever did the uh, lineup probably may have uh, looked at it and saw lefty-lefty and moved on. Um, but that's sometimes what happens when yeah, you, got, so. you got the new people filling them out. So I would suspect Gallo's going to be in the lineup. Yeah, so, I mean, regardless, we'll, we'll know. If yeah. Gallo's in the lineup, I like Joey Gallo. All right. Let's see. Uh, yikes. If we're going to do stacks here, uh, I would think we're probably going to go to that Detroit and Boston game for at least number one and maybe number two. Uh, do you want to throw in a number three here out of our ten choices? Seattle, because we don't know what we're getting from Taylor Hearn. There's obviously a pretty legitimate chance that these guys – you know, get to him in a hurry, and it's a bad Texas bullpen behind him. So that's a spot where I'd be looking to play both sides in tournaments. But uh, Boston, you know, probably everyone's number one stack. Yes, <laughs> they're um, not going under the radar. Yeah, uh, Philly, Philly also. You know, I like Caleb Smith. I like his upside, but he does give up some power to righties, and you know, Harper's not bad against lefties either. So I think it is a spot where he could potentially uh, give up some some home runs. All right, with that. We got you there to work, hopefully, on your Thursday. You can get uh, Thursday morning at 9.15. You get one uh, Dave Lochran, you know him better as Laffy D, along with Josh Engelman on the DFS Strategy Show. They will be breaking down both ends of this slate. We will have uh, Live Before Lock. Uh, I don't know. We'll have to, we might have the deep dive. We'll, we'll see. Without them traveling and they're just a five-game slate, we may uh, call that one, uh, but we'll have that posted on uh thursday so you guys will find out we will have uh, it, it'll be there i'm writing it tonight oh sorry no i meant i'm sorry i meant the show i meant the uh, show. uh it'll be josh and lofty oh okay there you are so you got the show so you're gonna get three hours uh of baseball live show content for the uh 13 game pardon me the eight games tomorrow <laughs> enjoy that uh it'll be a good one and then we've got robust schedules Heading into Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Check out uh, the Osmo NFL Twitter handle. They're doing some uh, contests there for some give it, giveaways. Give a follow, give a retweet, follow those instructions. You can win yourself a prize for the NFL draft that is coming up this weekend. Be sure to follow Adam at Ship My Money DFS to see what uh, fun adventures he gets into. I am at Emac DFS. You know, I'm not going to be doing anything crazy, but I'm almost at 10,000. So if you want to be lucky number 10,000 follower for me, you'll get to... Uh, I'll get you a one-month subscription to Osmo.com. There you go. Whoever hits number 10,000, I'll hook you up on that one. That is one. cheating. What? That is cheating. That's cheating? <laughs> what? Just because I can turn it on in the background? <laughs> <laughs> you know, doing doing some of the some of the behind-the-scenes work does have its privileges, Adam. And who knows? Is anybody still listening at this point? We'll see. I am 33 followers shy of 10,000, so hopefully we'll get that this weekend. With that, gamers, good luck.